Hallelujah. Well, let's just pray before we get into the word this morning. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it goes out, Lord. It never returns empty or void, but it accomplishes that that you desire it to do. And I pray, Father, that this morning in our hearts, in our minds, Lord God, your word will accomplish your purposes in our lives, in our mentality, in our heart, in our spirit, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, welcome if you're visiting as well. Please hang around, have a coffee afterwards with us. It'd be great to get to know you. So if you want a title for today's sermon, this is a bit of tongue-in-cheek, so don't throw anything, okay? It's, let us make God in our image. Let us make God in our image. Now, we read the scripture in Genesis 26 this morning. It says, let us make man in our image. But we're living in society now where humanity wants to reform, rename, remake God and make God in the image of man so that our moral standing as humans that God can fit into that because a lot of the time we don't like what God is doing, who he is, how he represents himself. So we're trying in society, there's this whole thing of redefinition, redefining everything. And uh, so let us make God in our image. That's the society that we live in. Non-Christians find it confusing and non-Christians are wanting the church to stand up. There's churches and denominations now that are saying they're going to debate the gender of God and all these different things. And let me just tell you now, it's blasphemous. It's wrong, it's not right, it's not the word of God, it doesn't flow with the Holy Spirit. These things are not right. And whatever denominations do these things or even consider these things, it's not right. Because, do you know what? God has already stated who he is, what he's about, what his mission is, in his word. Amen? And we don't need to add to it, and we don't need to take away from it. We just need to accept it. Now, not everything in the word of God is pal- palatable to me. It, it, it clashes with my flesh, you know? But I have to submit to the Word of God. The Word of God is a written, inspired Word of God. And so we live in a society where I've watched things where even non-Christians are saying, why won't the church stand up? Why won't the church say something? Why is the church allowing itself to be pushed in a corner and reshaped? And sometimes it's done under the umbrella of inclusion. God is all loving, all embracing, and churches are desperate to have people come through the door, so we don't want to offend anyone, so we we just make everything palatable. Well, God doesn't mind. It's okay. And that is not a work of the Spirit, and that is not to represent God correctly. Genesis uh, 1.26 said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, uh, birds of the sky, and over all the livestock and wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. Now, the biblical viewpoint is the only viewpoint. You know, sometimes people have their opinions. Uh, when me and Mara used to help people with marriage courses and stuff like that and the couple have fallen out, they kind of want you to take sides sometimes from their points of view. And we used to have to say, we're not on your side and we're not on your side, we're on his side. That's the only side. There are some things Christians don't have an opinion on. There are elements I don't have an opinion because my opinion is the word of God. And I don't need my own opinion because I'm an ambassador and I represent God. And the church, we are all ambassadors of Christ. And as ambassadors in any country or any place, you, you can't enforce your own view. You are there to represent the country that has sent you. So therefore, if we are ambassadors of Christ on this earth, 
we represent the Father and we represent his rule, his kingdom rule, what God has said. We can't just change it because we don't like it. Amen? So it's no good being an ambassador of England and you're in another country and you turn around and say, well, yes, well, in England, <coughs> as an ambassador here, I'm supposed to represent all the history of the country, the nation, and our royalty and different things. So, but I don't like our royalty. I don't think Charlie's doing a good job. And uh, I'm not very impressed with the government. And in actual fact, I don't really agree with a lot of it. So I'll just forget all of that. I won't represent any of it. You have misrepresented the nation. And the danger is we can misrepresent God. And we've got to be very, very wise in these days. These are perilous times. And a lot of people don't see that. They don't see it as living in perilous times. But we are, for lots of different reasons. And we see things changing time and time again in the world. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. Amen? Grace and truth. So there's a mixture between grace and applying grace to what we do, but yet still standing on the truth. And we can't move away from the truth, but we apply the truth in grace. In John 8, there's the example with Jesus, and Jesus prevented the religious leaders from stoning the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Now, he wasn't accepting the woman's sin. He did not accept her sin. He told her to sin no more. But what he did do was say she was released from the condemnation. Amen? She was released from condemnation. And Jesus never rejected people, but he didn't accept the wrong behaviour, and he pointed it out. And sometimes we've got to reject the wrong behaviour without rejecting the person, you know? You love the person, but you don't have to agree with the behaviour. And that's a fine balance of truth and grace. That's the balance that we need the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into when we're dealing with a lot of these things. There's a warped understanding in humanity now. And this warped understanding is to what love is and what love appears to be. You know? And there's a, 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 a thing in the world now that you must love me unconditionally. You must love me. And the only way you can show me if you love me unconditionally, you must accept everything that I am and everything that I say, that's unconditional love. That's the world's view of unconditional love. However, Scripture is clear that God himself is love. He is the definition of love. He is the source of love. Yet, he loves us, he sent his son to die for us, but yet, as a father loves a son, he disciplines us. Amen? Why? Because he loves us. Love isn't to say you can do whatever you want, and that's it. Love, in love, there are boundaries. So with, with my children, you know, when they were little, it's, oh, Dad, can we have McDonald's? Oh, Dad, can we have sweets? Even last night, oh, Dad, can we have pizza? And they conned, conned me again into getting pizza. It, you can't go on a diet in our house. It's impossible. And I said to my, if we didn't have the kids living at home, I'd be able to die. I'd do it easily. But because the kids, predominantly one of them, is a fast food guru, I, I, can't, I, I find it so hard, you know? But children, they want something. Say, so, oh, if you loved me, you'd get it for me. And say, so, no, well, it's because I love you, you can't have it. So if you give a child everything that it wants, guess what? Invariably, it would be bad for the child. Sweets, it would just rot their teeth away. I know one kid lived along our road when I was a, a, a young lad, and his teeth were rotten away because his mother just gave him sweets all the time. Now, that's not good. And God is not going to, you know, you get people who say, oh, God, he gives you every desire of your heart. Here's a wake-up call. No, he won't. 
I still haven't got a Bentley. You know? God won't give you every desire of your heart because every desire of your heart is not God's will for you. You know? If we had all the desires of our heart, we'd probably be a mess. Amen? So we have to understand what love is. Love comes with constraints. Love comes with sacrifices. Love comes with pushing away your own desire for a greater desire. That's what love is. And Jesus loved people, but he still fathered them and he still brought correction to wrong behaviour. And scripture's clear that God loves us but he will discipline us, just like a father disciplines a child. Now, nobody likes God's discipline. No child likes his father's discipline. But years later, you can see, do you know what? Yeah, he, my dad was right. And when you have that revelation, you, that's, that's the revelation of also that you're getting old. Yeah. You have that revelation. You've turned into your parents. And it's, uh, it's heartbreaking that day. You look in the mirror and you go, I am my own father. I can't believe it. You know? Jesus died for the sins of the world, but he brought resurrection life. He brought a new order to humanity. Jesus did not come to be agreeable. Being a Christian, you will never be politically correct. It's an impossibility. Jesus was never politically correct. He was politically incorrect. He stood against the religious world. He stood against the Pharisees. He stood against the, the political world of the Romans. He stood against the philosophy of the Greeks. He was not socially acceptable. And as a Christian, Scripture says, to some we are, we're the breath of life, to others we're the fragrance of death. Be careful who you invite round for dinner. You know? But to believers, we bring life and encouragement. But to the world, they don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to, you know, this, that and the other. And so we're the fragrance of death. Oh no, not those Christians. Coming round to my ass, do gooders going to talk about God or something, you know? But we are the fragrance of life as well, the life of Jesus to a hurting world. But Jesus didn't come to be agreeable. He said, I've set father up against, uh, uh, father up against sons, uh, parents against their children, and so on and so forth. And, and the, the gospel cuts, and it's difficult. And even with my children, we've had discussions, and I've had to say, well, I'm sorry. But this is the way God wants me to move and I will not budge on it. And it, it is not up for debate. Save your breath. It's not up for debate. It's not my point of view, it's God's point of view and that is it. There are other things that we can debate. KFC or pizza, you know, I mean, the important things in life. But there are some things that are not up for debate. And why, why is the church in general choosing to debate the things that are not up for debate? They're not on the agenda. And as Christians, we've got to find the balance of how do I stand up and say, no, this far and no more, yet at the same time not rejecting the world and still portraying a God of love and acceptance and grace. And how do we find that, that balance? You know, the gospel is a mix of tenderness and toughness. Jesus, with one, he, he said, suffer all the children unto me, let them come to me. And he's so gentle, and with different people, he's so gentle. And, he said, and then Peter comes along, and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, so hang on a minute. <laughs> you know, what's going on here? And Jesus is a mixture of toughness and tenderness, and that's the the, the word. And the tenderness is the love of God and the toughness is the love of God. The modern church is finding itself in a place of compromise, it, misrepresenting the very character and nature of God. A lot of Christians, with stuff that comes up in this woke 
cancel culture generations don't know really what their point of view is or what they're not quite sure what they should be doing. It's all quite confusing, you know. I can remember years ago, I grew up in a predominantly white environment. We didn't have any black children at our school. There was no black kids on our estate. And then as times moved on, our culture and different people had come from different countries. And uh, you, were, you could be fearful. You didn't know, how do I address a person of colour? Because you didn't know, you didn't want to offend. Do I call somebody a black person? Do I call them a coloured person? Do I call them a, a person of this, that and the other? And it, it's this fear in society of getting things wrong and being offensive when we don't desire that, you know? In, in, in the kingdom of God, there is no colour. You're not identified by colour. Probably identified by stupidity. <laughs> you know, when I enter the gates of Eden, God, God will be letting go, here we go, boys, you've got your work cut out with this one. He's a white idiot. All those boys from St. George's, they were a dodgy lot, I tell you. <laughs> but we live in a... We don't know what to say. You, you, we don't know how to deal with it, you know. Uh, uh, do you open a door for a woman to walk through at the supermarket? Years ago, when I was young, that was something which was honourable. You do it now, they might look at you and say, well, you're the door for me. We're trying to say, I'm weak, can't open the door myself, sexist bigot, and walk off. You, what are you meant to do? I don't know what to do anymore. Open the door. Oh, look, I just you know, slam it in her face. And that's, what do you do in society? And the church, the Christian, the believer, has got to be the salt and the light. And in this world of confusion, we've got to bring clarity. Because God is not a God of confusion. Amen? And we have got to be the ones who know our God, and we know his viewpoint, and we know his word, and we can portray that without tearing people apart. I met a guy years ago, I was witnessing to, and, uh, and I will call him a guy, uh, but he had a wig on, long hair, and had a black leather mini skirt and sort of boob tube things I think they're called and all this sort of thing is made with Brian you know and uh, it really weren't working for him Ricky will remember him Ricky liked him nearly went on a date but anyway uh, and I kept witnessing to this guy and do you know what this guy came to church and he came to church in his black mini skirt and this that and the other and I was really thrilled that he came to church and then I took him aside, I said, listen, it's brilliant you're coming to church, but it's going to fuel some confusion. Now, I know you like your skirts and your female thing, and he was having the whole work done, you know, hormone therapy. And I said, but you know what? I said, God loves you. Irrespective, God loves you and I love you. But I don't accept you're making the best choices for you. And we sat down and we chatted. I said, why, why, how have you got to this place? And do you know what? It all stemmed down to his childhood and rejection problems. He turned up the next week in a pair of trousers. Now, I don't know if he went on and made a, a confession of Christ being his Lord or so on and so forth, but it's accepting people but not accepting wrong behaviour. It's loving people but not compromising who God is to be able to love them. You know, and it's meeting people where they were at. Jesus made friends with the tax collector and the sinner. He didn't clean them all up, make them shiny and say, oh, now we can go out to play. He met them. Well, we were dead in our sin, Christ died for us. Well, we were dead in it. That's the point. Jesus looked at you and said, they're worth dying for. See, sin is sin. And in the world, we, in the modern day Christianity, we categorise it. You know, we categorise it. Oh, it's only a little white lie. No such thing as a little white lie. A lie is a lie, and that's it, you know. You can't, you can't break the speed limit. If you broke the speed limit by one mile an hour, you broke the speed limit, okay? You, you, you just, we just have to accept, but sometimes we brush things off. And we say, oh, it's all right. It's, it's only a minor thing. But it's not like I do any big sins. You know, big sins in our house are not filling up the dishwasher. That's a big sin. I mean, that is, that, that comes with repercussions, 
that sin. And then there's little sins. See, my big sin is not filling up the dishwasher. Okay? Caleb's big sin is not putting stuff out in the recycling. Okay? Luke's big sin is telling mum about me and Caleb. (laughs) And Mara's big sin is every Monday going on a diet. Every single Monday without foul, starting a diet. And, and, and these things that she's allergic to, oh, I can't eat bread. I'm not, I don't want to offend anyone, I'm not fat at all. It's just bread that bloats me out. I'm not fat, it's water retention. Water retention, what have you done? Drunk the ocean, woman? What are you talking about, water retention? And every Monday she starts to die. It's broken by Tuesday. Oh, I'm just, I'm just going to finish this last box of chocolates. I'm just going to finish this last cake. I'm just going to have this last thing. And there's all different levels of sin in our house. But irrespective of the level of sin in the world, do you know what? We've got to understand that sin is sin. And even though the world might be redefining this, that and the other, and churches are redefining, God loves us all. And we've got to somehow not let our own frustration get in the way of the love of God. And that can be difficult, if you're like Mike. Because his frustration will get in the way, you know, because it's frustrating when you see people trying to redefine our Lord. How dare they? How dare they? Nail them up! Crucify some of them! See how they like it! You know, uh, and we get frustrated and we get angry. And then we become obedient to our wives and we calm down. Because you know your wife just touches you and just, that's the calm down button. If it's really bad and it's in public, she will just look at you. You know, you get away with what you can because there's company. But once the company's gone, you're going to get it both barrels, right? So without us, you know, we, we haven't got to get our Bibles and turn them into pitchforks and start smashing the world up and going on a rampage because Jesus said at the cross, it's finished. It's finished. The cross is the complete finished work of God. So we have to move in the complete finished victory. There's a lot of fights that Christians are fighting that they don't need to fight. The battle is the Lord's. Just work out how to get to the victory. But the battle is the Lord's. Now we see the, the, the gender of God being up for debate. Should we refer to God with masculine pronouns? Well, let the argument be put to bed through the word of God. The Old Testament, masculine pronouns for God are used time and time again. Scripture contains approximately 170 references to God as a father. Now, by necessity, one cannot be a father unless they are male. Jesus refers to God the Father several times. I mean, even when he teaches the disciples how to pray, he says straight away, this is how you should pray, our Father. Now the important bit is, Jesus says, this is how you should pray. And he's told us how we communicate with God. Jesus references God time and time again as his Father. He says, I am I and the Father are one. And Jesus came in human form as a man to die on a cross. We also see in John 16, 13, where Jesus is teaching his disciples, and this reference is the Holy Spirit. And he says, When he's talking about the Holy Spirit, and he says, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. And all that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said 
the Spirit you will receive from what He will make known to you. If there's any confusion, the Holy Spirit, that's a mal emphasis. Amen? That's a mal emphasis. God's Spirit projects himself as male. Now, there are some which will say, well, God is, God is far beyond gender and human realities and so on, and he is. You know, when God uh, describes his love, he, he says, you know, I lift you up in my arms. You know, or you stand on the everlasting arms of God. And he uses a language that we can relate to as his creation. He could turn around and say, I lift you up in my everlasting elops. <laughs> the trouble is, we don't know what an elop is. I don't know what an elop is. I just invented it. But maybe God doesn't have arms in that sense, but he has elops. But he's chosen to project and reveal himself to us in a language that we can understand and we can relate to. Amen? That's the grace of God for humanity. He used masculine pronouns to, re re uh, to refer to himself time and time again. And we must stand on these truths. Now it shouldn't surprise us the day and age of what we live and the change in society. Society is changing so fast, super, super fast. It is... It is Unbelievable. We are in that end time chapter of the church of Jesus Christ. And we see things changing at an incredible weight all the time. But 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will become lovers of themselves. People will become lovers of themselves. They love themselves more than God, more than each other. People will become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, but treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. What is the power? Well, it's love. That is the power of God. His love and it's pure, and it's holy, and it's sanctified. And lots of the behaviour that the world globally wants to accept and adhere to is not sanctified, holy, and pure unto the Lord. And sometimes we turn around and say, well, we don't like the rules. Well, them's the rules, you know. I happen to support God's own football team, which is Arsenal. We know God supports Arsenal. If you didn't know, that's a deep theological revelation this morning. Uh, but if somebody wants to play for Arsenal, when they turn up, one of the players turns up on a Saturday morning or whatever for Arsenal Football Club, and they're all in their red and white stripes, and he turns up in yellow or blue, they're going to say, well, hang on a minute. You're meant to be representing us. You're meant to be part of the team. Why are you wearing a blue football kit when we're wearing a... A red one today. I like blue. <laughs> Excellent. Buy a blue car then. We're playing in red. That's the team's colour. That is the choice that's been made. That is what the manager has decided. Yeah, but it's my right to wear blue. It is your right to wear blue, and you can wear whatever blue you want. But if you want to wear blue and represent this club, that's not going to work. Because this club has already chosen red. Now, if you want to wear blue and play for a lesser team, go find Chelsea. Or, <laughs> you know, uh, go, go find another team. Because at the end of the day, people are coming into the church and they're saying, well, I don't like it like this, I don't like it like that. You can change it to represent what? Me. 
Well, the church isn't here to represent us, it represents him. Amen. Amen? That's who the church represents. Jesus Christ. Matthew 24, verse 4. Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. And many are being deceived and gullible and getting pulled into stuff. Many, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of birth pains. So we must know the time and the hour. We're not shocked by these things, what happened, because scriptures pre-warned us. Like the days of Noah. Now, for many people, they do believe in, in a higher power of a God. But they want, they want this God to be recreated. They want a God, and even some in the church want a God to become uh, gender neutral, tolerant of sin, compromised in his holiness. They want a God that is at the disposal of man. They want the creator to become obedient to the creation and understand how I feel and what I think and what my bar is. There are people who are long for a tailor-made God to suit them. Remember years ago, they started looking into having a tailor-made child where you could muck around with the DNA and pick the eye colour and this, that and the other and all that sort of stuff. Well, people want that for God now. I want a tailor-made God who represents me, does everything that I want, that I agree with. And it's a dangerous thing. The new version of the gospel is let us make God in our image. God can fit in my box. God can support my mentality, my gender, my sexual orientation, my view on life and everything else because it's my right, it's my truth. Isaiah 5, verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. What about that? Let that sink in for a little bit, just in today's society, you know? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. See, people have lost what's right or wrong. They're not sure anymore. Everything's being renamed, redefined, recreated to support our own personal agenda. Over the centuries, people, mankind, have worshipped many types of God, which are no gods at all. Redefining God to suit our own desires. But one thing we haven't mentioned in closing is Satan. Satan is the God of this world, as it were. Satan's influence is throughout generations, throughout the nations. Remember, Satan did not want to do away with God. Satan merely wanted God to be lower than him. He said, I will ascend my throne above the stars of God. He never said, I'm going to destroy God. See, when Satan came and tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he never said he, was going to, he wanted to kill Jesus, did he? He didn't attack him in that thing. What he wanted, he wanted Jesus to bow down and worship him. He wanted himself to become greater. And Satan's still the same today. And Isaiah, talking of Satan, Isaiah 14, verse 12, said, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nation, said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven and I will raise my throne above the stars of God. See, God 
puts all things in order in creation, the stars, the universe. Do you know, even when you don't go out all week, you've moved millions of miles throughout that week because the earth is spinning, continually spinning. And then in our solar system, the, the solar system is also spinning. So the earth is spinning at one speed, the solar system spinning at another, and then all of it is spinning and rushing through the universe. And the universe is ever-expanding. But it's all in creative order that God has designed. Absolutely wonderful. You don't even get seasick. Yeah. But God has created it. An abomination in the eyes of the Lord is when we change the creative order of God. And that becomes an abomination to God. And we change what God has created and his creative order, you know. And that's where we've got to be very careful. And we see in society now, uh, so much is trying to be recreated. So much is trying to be changed from what God has set in place. Now, despite all of these things, we have a wonderful hope. And that hope is Christ Jesus. We have a hope and we have a mission to be a light in the darkness. We have to uh, show the love of God. We have to be sensitive. We have to show people God's love. We don't need to become militant on God's behalf. Pick, picking up our Bibles, as I said, like a pitchfork and going on the war path. But rather remembering what Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not. Forgive them. They don't really know what they're doing. They have no concept of what they're touching and what they're delving in and the things that's coming out of their mouth. It is beyond their understanding because if they truly knew God, then they wouldn't do it. The fear of God being the beginning of wisdom and these things get changed because we lose the fear of God and the fear of man becomes greater. Well, we don't want to reject anyone, and our fear of man is greater than our fear of God. So we compromise God because we don't want to reject man because we're more fearful. But Scripture says fear of man is a snare. It will trip you up. It will trap you. And we have to keep a reverent fear of God. Scripture says we do not fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against powers and principalities that are behind these things. The most effective weapon we have in this day and age is love, not acceptance. Love. Love, love, love. Just keep loving people. I don't care what they're like, what, you know, if, I, if they want to identify themselves as a donkey, go for it and call yourself Balak and Balaam and so on and so forth. They've not got a problem. I'm still going to love you irrespective of you because God does that to us. And we still love people from every walk and every shape and every colour on the tree and everything else. But we don't compromise our God. We don't accept sin, but we love the sinner. Amen? We love the individuals. And we pray for them. And we show them the love of God. And we encourage them. We don't make God's love conditional as to who they are. Oh, well, you do that, so sorry, I can't really be in a relationship with you, and you do this, so I won't be in a relationship with you. Well, you want to look at yourself. What are you like? Amen? Well, we start trying to get the speck out of everybody else's eye. We've got the Amazon jungle in our eye, you know? We have to bear that in mind. But let's remember Stephen, who in the face of his murderers asked for God's forgiveness for them. Placed them in the hands of God. What we do need in this generation of church is wisdom and discernment. Wisdom and discernment. Wisdom to say the right thing. The wisdom to be calm. The wisdom to know the word of God, and the discernment to be led by the Holy Spirit. How do I engage with this people group without compromising myself, without compromising you, but without pushing them away? Because you love them. 
You care for them. You think you're sent to die on a cross. You agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane for them. You paid a price. See, Jesus died for the sins of the world, not just the sins of Christians. Amen? He didn't just die for the sins of all those who would accept him. He died for every Muslim. He died for every Buddhist. He died for every transgender. He died for every Tottenham supporter. He died for the sins of... Yeah, everyone. I mean, he went that far beyond himself. He died for the, the sin, and he had to die for the sins of the world. Even if the world were not going to accept him, he still died for the sins of the world. It had, sin had to be dealt with and nullified, and it was dealt with at the cross for each and every person in this world. Sin is no longer a barrier because Jesus has dealt with the barrier of sin at the cross. And everyone can come to Christ. Wonderful, I love it, I love him. In closing, we need discernment, we need wisdom. Wisdom in the church is being replaced with intellect. Intellectual discussions about God, intellectual discussions about theology. We don't need no intellectual discussions. We need wisdom. We need the word of God. Amen? And then last scripture, Isaiah 64, verse 8. And this scripture talks about him being the potter and we are the clay. Amen. He's the potter and we are the clay. When I was at school, I loved pottery, predominantly because there was no homework. It was brilliant. Uh, there was no homework. There was no reading or writing. There was nothing, you know. And so I booked myself down for pottery. For my options, I chose pottery. I tried to pick it three times. They wouldn't let me. I said, you've got to pick up a subject as well. I said, but I do like pottery. And you don't know, I might need an ottery in life in the future as a qualification. But he's the potter and we're the clay. And when I used to make things, it was down to my imagination, what I made. You know, that lump of clay didn't turn around and go, oh, hang on a minute, I want a bit of this or a bit of that. No, 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 no. It was down to me. It's down to God. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. If you want prayer this morning, you can come forward. We'll pray with you and for you. If you, if, uh, you know, I really believe that we need a, a fresh anointing of wisdom and discernment to know how to walk in these perilous times. How do we walk? How do we balance everything which is changing so fast? And if that's you and you're finding it difficult, then I'll pray with you and for you. Join us for tea and coffee out the back afterwards. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you that it is inspired, is out of the very mouth of God. Father, I thank you that we're not to detract from it, we're not to add to it, we're not to manipulate it, but rather we're meant to read it, read it and read it and let it build faith in our heart. Father, I pray for each one of us as we go about our work this week and our lives, Lord, that you will equip us to shine for you, to shine for you, Lord Jesus. That you will give us wisdom, you will give us grace. Lord, we will be moved with compassion but we will be uncompromising to the God that we serve, just like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They said, we will not bow down to these other images. We'll not do it. Oh, hallelujah. Give the church the backbone in this day and age to be exactly the same. We'll not bow down, but rather we will love and encourage. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah.